Okay, so I'm going to introduce our moderator, who is my friend and the director of GW Cybersecurity and Privacy Research Institute, Hostess Tregas. And we are going to begin in a minute. Okay, take it away, Hostess. Thanks very much, Susan. And uh, welcome to the next panel. Uh, we're going to debate the discussion, picking up on strands from uh, yesterday, and also from this excellent uh, keynote address uh, this morning. Um, I thought that yesterday we ended up with kind of two major uh, elements. One is we talk about laws and policy inside the metaverse. We talk about laws and policies in the real world but as they affect the metaverse. And then secondly, we thought about uh, how can we actually do something about it? This was a frustration that I heard yesterday afternoon. Let's do something. Let's stop talking and let's do something. And the question is, what is there to do? What do we do? Who does it? And how can we help whoever it is that can take action, take that action? So this morning, hopefully, because the panel is called policy and how to impact policy, uh, we can begin to answer some of these questions. So I have a great uh, uh, panel uh, to help us uh, with that. Uh, I have Kavya Perlman on my right, who is the founder and CEO of XR Safety Initiative. She needs no introduction. Uh, Christina Podnar, who is the executive leader of the Metaverse Reality Check. And then uh, Carrie Valadares, uh, who is uh, a last minute substitute for uh, our Yaja uh, Peters. <laughs> Uh, from uh, uh, Microsoft. Um, so we have a, a wealth of uh, expert expertise on this uh, panel. Uh, so let's uh, let's uh, kind of dive in. The, one of the things that uh, our keynote, uh, Alan Graylin mentioned is uh, the lack of a, of a coordinated, let's say, international framework. And Kavya, have you done a lot of work on frameworks? If you could perhaps start us off by talking a little bit about the framework that you espouse, but also try to focus it on safety and inclusion because those are really the topics for our, for our discussion this morning. Totally. Thanks for that, Hostess. And I don't know if I need, the, you know, don't need the introduction, honestly. Uh, I encourage you to read about my work if you haven't already encountered it. We started XRSI mission in 2019. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was the head of security for Linden Lab. As some of you may know, the makers of the oldest existing virtual world, Second Life. So my real work really started even before that, like 2016, when I was advising Facebook for third-party security risks during 2016, this presidential election time. That told me that when you ignore security, then there could be like democracies will be undermined. That could happen. And then Second Life was is the oldest existing virtual world where I had to deal with these issues. <clears throat> After departing Second Life, we started with XRSI privacy and safety framework. Mm -hmm. um, this framework, I realized immediately that one thing you can't do with these frameworks, one, it, of course, has to be global. And that comes from my realization of my background as master's in network security, cybersecurity. There are no geopolitical boundaries when it comes to attack service. It, you know, there are certainly physical geopolitical boundaries, but in the cyberspace, that is very hard to determine and track. So when it comes to virtual wars, it gets even more challenging. So the frameworks have to be global. That's one. Immediately after we started the work towards safety, now let me go back to why safety. Um, safety is sort of like, you know, and we started to really nail down on XR safety, extended reality safety. When you <coughs> extend your reality into another dimension, you are really talking about pixels and, you know, you're talking about putting yourself uh, at the mercy of these <laughs> cybersecurity concerns or any actor could potentially manipulate your reality. In fact, one of the first things was we uncovered novel cyber attacks ability and this is a research done by university of new haven's uh, assistant dean uh, 
Abraham Bejili, one of our board members, and basically ability to move a subject without their, without their knowledge while they're just playing a video game. So that tells us that you can really manipulate these environments. And there are several five, six novel cyber attacks. So we look at it from cybersecurity perspective. So, because you know, if you're hacked, would you feel safe? And then on top of that, when it comes to safety, I myself have been subject to harassment or bullying. And, you know, just by, you know, my identity as I represent myself as a hijabi Muslim woman, when I showed up as an avatar, as a hijabi in virtual wars, immediately somebody said, oh, she's bringing Sharia law. Whereas like, I am the most like sort of progressive person. So it made me realize, and then the collective knowledge of advisors that however we represent inclusion has to be a priority as well. Earlier, Alvin was saying like, you know, you can be anybody, but at the same time, the moment you assume an identity, it can potentially put you at risk. So how do you moderate that? And that's what this whole XRSI privacy and security framework is about, is bringing in multidisciplinary stakeholders, whether it is from privacy, policy, uh, XR, VR, all these other perspectives, to put them together to pursue like what could be the potential proactive solutions here. Great, that's a great start. If I can, if I can ask uh, Carrie to weigh in, especially on the on the topic of uh, safety uh, and inclusion, I think those are two topics that uh, in Microsoft's mesh work that you deal with almost daily. So, Absolutely. can you give us a little perspective yes. on that? Sure, and actually, I'd like to kind of follow on to where Kavi left off because we do spend a lot of time thinking about inclusion and um, this question of whether or not one's physical identity needs to match to one's representative identity. And it may be that, you know, who you feel you are isn't necessarily how you're reflected in the physical world. And it's important that people, that's one of the kind of powerful new options in digital space is that you can represent yourself in a way that feels more honest and more authentic than perhaps you are perceived by others in physical space. Um, however, we all know that where there is anonymity, oftentimes there is antisocial behavior. And so at the same time as you're aiming for inclusion and the ability to you know, give people the options to present themselves in a way where they feel the most comfortable and they feel the most empowered, you are creating this kind of risk factor where people may be presenting themselves. I mean, the obvious example is, you know, a 65-year-old man presents himself as a 14-year-old girl and engages in grooming or some other kind of activity and something like that. So um, that's something that we have been talking about quite a lot. What's the right balance there? How do you manage that kind of behavior? Um, I thought that the, the keynote was very interesting and the comment about uh, this, the kind of hopeful statement that with more prolific metaverse and more engagement, we would have better democracy and a, a flow of information. You know, perhaps I'm more of a negative thinker, but I tend to think that again, where there is less control of information flow and anonymity, you tend to get you know less valid information, right? Lots of people kind of just sharing what they saw or what they think, and or even intentionally seeding fake news. Um, we also heard that in order to log into social systems in China, you have to input your national identity number. So there, your identity, your representative identity, at least to someone, maybe not the other users, but to the service provider is linked to a real physical person in the real world, which makes enforcement bazillions of times easier. Um, that's not something that I think is done worldwide. And so uh, Kavi and I were talking earlier, I'm sorry, I'm jumping from topic to topic. But Kavi and I were talking earlier about how, um, you know, so far we've dealt with online safety primarily through moderation and takedown. Moderation and takedown is a regime that works for when the majority of your harms are related to post content. Because for so long as the content persists, the harm persists. Once you take down the content, you resolve the harm. In the metaverse or in online interact, in you know, real time interactions, the harm is rarely posted content sometimes, and so moderation takedown still has a place, but oftentimes it's behavior, it's conduct moderation. 
it is not realistic or I think desirable for you know some service provider to be watching everyone's conduct and listening in on all of their conversations. I don't think anybody wants that. So in that case, it's almost impossible to prevent the harm from happening. And once it happens, really the only thing you can do is try to prevent it from happening again. Well, how do you do that when, sure, you can pull someone's access to the service, but they just go get another free online email and sign up again. So without linking it to a universal identifier, you know, a real physical identifier, social security number, or what have you, um, it's very, very difficult to keep you know, people from kind of repeating. So one thing we've been thinking about, and I'll leave it here and let, we'll leave it to the mother if you want to ask follow-up questions to the others on this. Um, yesterday in the jurisdiction panel, we talked about self-help. So we've been thinking about how in the physical world, we don't all rely on the police to keep us safe, which is really what moderation and take down is. It's a police, it's a police framework. We, we institute health self-help. We don't walk down dark alleys at night. We lock our doors. Some of us carry whistles, you know, mace, whatever. What is the equivalent of that in the digital space? And how can developers, how can software companies create tools to give users agency so that they can decide how deeply they want to engage, with whom they want to engage, how much of themselves they want to share, and in that sense, start to protect themselves from behavior that may, you know, they may encounter in digital space rather than just relying on the service provider to keep them safe. For sure, the service provider will need to create those tools and provide them, but then leave it up to each individual to decide you know, what tools they want to use and how they want to present themselves. Yeah, this is excellent. And Alvin basically gave us three stages. Mm -hmm. This last stage was exactly. user, exactly. user driven. I think uh, yesterday, uh, we also heard from uh, Eugene Bullock, who said basically let the user block out some nasty guy that he or she doesn't yeah. want to interact with. Don't expect some external system to, uh, to do that. Uh, if I can kind of gently shift to a, to a, to a question that gets us closer to policy now. Christina, uh, you work uh, with the Metaverse Reality Check, engages you with governments. And I wonder if you can begin to enter the discussion, how do you get governments to create policy that is reflected? Should we keep governments away? In some areas, governments are not the people. In some areas, governments are very much the people. So we have a variety of definitions for what a government is. So can you start us on that direction? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's a great conversation point. I think one of the mistakes that we make these days is to say, oh, the government needs to tell us what to do, right? We've never actually had that in the past. Or do we just say, hey, I'm going to sit here. The government needs to tell me what to do. Instead, what we believe at the MRC, at the Metaverse Reality Check, is that it's really an ongoing conversation of multiple stakeholders. Yes, we do need governments to be involved. Yes, we do need policy. However, it's not just policy that's going to come and save the day. It's not going to happen that way. It does require academia. It does require the citizen. It does require non-governmental uh, entities. It does require governments themselves. And what we're really seeing is a delay in governments to create policy because a lot of people just don't understand at the governmental regulatory level what we're really encountering right now. And so they're listening a lot to organizations that are moving really fast, that are trying to be at the forefront of innovation. And not to really say that innovation is bad. I'm a fundamental believer in creativity and innovation. But I believe that that needs to happen within a framework. Right? We need to have freedom within a framework. We need to understand what the boundaries are. When are we starting to put individuals at risk and at harm? And we need to be asking ourselves questions along the way. For example, one of the things that I've been listening to everybody talk about this morning is, oh, great, we're going to be in the metaverse. We can represent ourselves however we want to. Well, that's exciting in some ways. But what does that do to me as an individual if I can't be who I really am in, in the physical world, in the online world? I mean, doesn't that have a psychological impact on me? Is that not negative? Is that not closeting me and asking me to suppress myself? And so one of the things that we're really seeing is a lack, and I'm talking from a generalization perspective, a lack of digital policy in government because we are still at the forefront. And it is a very natural tendency to not govern early. In fact, I would argue you don't want to govern too early because then you quash innovation. However, I think we're at a point now where we're starting to see some of the harms that are going to come into effect. And I think we're at a point where we need to do a lot more studies. We need to actually educate ourselves. We need to educate others in order to really start to take the first steps. 
So process, you actually said, hey, what are we seeing in the policy space? Mm -hmm. We are seeing some you know, cutting edge leadership, if you will. Um, XRSI and MRC are very proud to be working with the government of Australia, leading the way in privacy by design. And it's wonderful to see a concept introduced in the regulatory and policy realm that isn't just in the moment a knee-jerk reaction to a specific technology. Instead, when we talk obviously about privacy by design and the framework that XRSI has provided, it's something that can scale over time. It's actually intended to grow as new technologies are introduced or even as immersive technologies change. And that's a critical point. And so I think, you know, whether it's privacy by design or safety by design and the framework that we have at XRSI, looking at very specific industries and understanding how do we adopt these principles is really critical. For example, healthcare, right? I mean, XRSI actually has a safety framework. We've been working a lot around the healthcare space. And yesterday I was actually interviewing one of the foremost neuroscientists in the neuro you know, space because he all day long does surgery in the XR space. And it was really refreshing to say, yes, look, we're adopting the XRSI framework, but we're also asking the intelligent questions of, hey, what is it like for you as a patient to experience immersive realities? What does that really do to you in the physical world? Are there positives? And sometimes there are, right? There's really good positives because sometimes, you know, patients can understand what their liver looks like, exactly what the surgery is going to be, that it's not going to be as invasive as they thought. They can see themselves, for example, if they have major burns on their body, you know, we can put them into an immersive environment where they're throwing snow globes at each other. And it's actually decreasing the stress, it's decreasing the need for, um, you know, pain clearers because the mind is naturally being supported through that thinking process. But again, we need to be at a point where we're not just doing things for the sake of doing them because we can, we need to be asking about policy and that's fundamentally what we're missing. And it's why I think that we need XRSI, we need the MRC and we need more policymakers to start getting educated about the risks and the opportunities, right? Because it's not all risk and it's not all bad. As we've heard today, there's a lot of really great opportunities, but we need to create that framework so we can have the freedom within the framework to act. And right now we're only seeing a handful of governments stepping up, asking the questions proactively, and certainly not doing it in a global fashion. So I'm gonna put a caveat on, on the spot uh, for our listeners that may not have uh, seen the latest version of the XRSI framework. It has four basic components, assess, inform, manage, and prevent. And in order to be able to understand how this framework, and NIST, for example, has a lot of frameworks, and other, the European Union has a lot of frameworks, the UN uh, organizations have a lot of frameworks. In order to implement the framework, A, you need to make sure it's created in a comprehensive and open way, and B, it's adopted. So, Tavia, how do you see the framework that X XRSI has worked very hard to create? be adopted by governments or by industry or by user groups or by nonprofits or your target audience for adoption? That's a really good question. And so before I address that, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the framework. So first, as you just mentioned, assess, inform, manage, and then prevent these four pillars. And then underneath, there are some functions where you go down to, hey, education and awareness, identity management. What does prevention mean, like harm prevention? So there are several different functions, and then that breaks down to controls. Now, the thing about this framework is, it's not that we're coming up with some new novel ideas. Yes, there are some novel discoveries, like you know, the way a person can perceive touch, scent and touch within the metaverse. How does that impact mental health, cognitive well-being, etc. So those kinds of novel considerations. But there's really something remarkable about this type of framework is we are borrowing a lot, in fact, mapping it constantly with the new and emerging as well as existing policies and regulations. So we all know GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation from the European Union. We are mapping some of those controls that we are putting together onto GDPR. There's a new law in uh, we're coming out from China. We have several intersections of technologies that we're ex exploring through this framework. Artificial intelligence. So why would we spin up something new when there is already a dedicated, multi-stakeholder, very cohesive effort on AI? 
why not adopt those? So this is how you create adoption, is to first take on everything that is being coming, that is emerging, and evaluate it against the immersive system. Okay, what can we apply? What can we adopt? When you do that, the adoption is being done by regulators. XRSI is not a regulator. We are made very, we are a small nonprofit who's trying to bring global governments, big tech organizations, nonprofits, and people together to stay ahead of safety and inclusion. So we are leaning on such as Julie Inman Brand. She's such a fierce advocate for safety, privacy, children's safety. So we're leaning on these governments that have already started reaching out all the way to United Nations, thinking about these type of frameworks, not just from risk, oh, organizational risk. That's a very obsolete thinking when you think about, oh, financial balance sheet, all these kinds of risks. Uh, we have to think about human in the loop. This technology has a human in the loop. And now we have to think about society in the loop. In 2016, what happened, in fact, it started in 2011, when you have Egyptian revolution happen. A 30-year-old dictator is brought down with the use of technology. We know that we can influence society. Now, this thing is sitting right next to our brain. If propaganda is delivered at a hand's distance in the early days, 2016 or 2020, now we're talking about yesterday's hearing, like insurrection happens when you don't pay attention to what technology is used to influence minds. Imagine when it's delivered directly to people's brain, but by just virtue of projecting some kind of a reality or embedded ideas. That's what we're at. So that's how we're gonna create adoption, is by leaning on some of these existing emerging frameworks and collaborating globally with, let's say, e-safety commissioner, whether it is DCMS in the UK, ICO UK, that has come up with age-appropriate design consideration for children. Um, and whereas in the US, like we have the 13 plus, but then COPA reform is happening, Children Online Privacy Act reform, we're working with Senator Ed Markey, Roy Tarhan, like all these senators and some of these House of Representatives, um, uh, Kathy Castor from Florida, these are some leading voices that are already reaching out to us, sharing early drafts, and we're able to then influence. Now, Congress, of course, has to do the rest of the work, and then other global regulators have to come on board as well. So there's a little hope there, too. Just fairly recently, XRSI is a part of this uh, World Economic Forum's new Metaverse Initiative. And there are very few selected. There are about 60 members. I, I think more and more governments and organizations need to take part of it. Microsoft is a part of it. XRSI is a part of it. And uh, But where is Apple? Where is ByteDance, TikTok? Want to play Metaverse, right? So let's, you know, we're... Here's a table is set, we're having global conversation. They need to come to this table. Um, in fact, uh, you know, so, so, and there are many tactics that I use strategically, and I'm not shy to from shaming people either sometimes. So it's like, hey, where are you? What are you up to? And so that's kind of like <clears throat> advocacy, <clears throat> collaboration, and enforcement. That's how we'll kind of. <clears throat> Very well said. Uh, Carrie, I'm going to put you on the spot uh, a little bit. Um, one of the words that was used extensively yesterday and again this morning was interoperability. And when people say interoperability, usually they mean the computer talks to the computer. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite uh, books uh, that was written a decade ago by Gas and Palfrey was Interoperability, Interop. And he, they identified four key issues, technology, data, the human being, and uh, the organization or institution. Mm -hmm. And they said we have to get interoperability, not only for the data, the machine, but also for the people and for the institution mm -hmm. itself. Can you tell me uh, in, in Microsoft, in, in the universe, uh, the mesh, uh, that you're uh, overseeing the, all the, the legal issues about do you go beyond the interoperability of machines and how do you kind of do the delicate dance on the human and 
on the organizational or institutional side of the board? Uh, okay, so I'm going to not, not talk much about policy and just talk about you know the kind of stages of interoperability as, as Microsoft sees it for right. um, metaverses. So uh, the first stage, with at least with Mesh, is a Mesh ecosystem in which a user has a persistent identity across various metaverses, you know, all sitting on the same platform. So in that circumstance, you have interoperability in a way you don't today. So imagine, you know, as you go about your life, maybe in the morning, you, you know, you log into work, and then later on in the day, you're in a really boring conference call. And so you decide to go check out like what's on sale at Nordstrom. And then, you know, you check your Instagram or your Facebook or whatever. Uh, then you've got to go check your kid's school calendar and see. And each, each one of those, you have a separate login. They know you as a separate person. Maybe you have a credit card, you know, on file with them. Maybe there's a little bit of federation. You might log in with your Google ID or something to more than one of those. But in each of those, you have a distinct relationship with that service provider, and they know you as an individual, and you kind of approach them anew. That's not how we operate in the real world. In the real world, we move through our life as one person, one identity. And so the vision for Mesh is it's much more similar to that. All of those things would sit on the Mesh ecosystem. You would take your identity, your avatars, your entitlements, all of those things from place to place to place to place to place with you know, some possible separation between professional and personal. Um, and you would experience all of that just like you do in the real world as one person and you know, what you do and what you like and how you choose to share is, is kind of shared. Uh, so that's, that's the first layer of interoperability across service providers. I think... In, as a general matter, when we talk about interoperability with metaverses, the next layer is much more interesting and much more complicated. And that's when, for example, Microsoft's Mesh ecosystem also interacts with Meta and whatever Google comes up with and whatever China comes up with. And when the user is no longer confined to a particular company's ecosystem, however broad that may be, but can actually take their identity and their entitlements and who knows what else from place to place to place. And for that, you need either regulation, although I, I tend to agree with some of the speakers yesterday, I think most of the regulation we have in place, the principles probably work for the risks raised by Metaverse and XR, but I think we need to be really, really thoughtful about coming up with new technological solutions to meet those principles. That's my personal opinion. Um, but I think the other really, really kind of promising avenue is standards. And that's where you're really talking about how are we going to meet these principles. We all agree you need radical consent, you need safety, you need inclusion, but there are gives and takes and there are questions as to how we achieve those things. Metaverses are crazy complicated. How do you explain to your average person, I mean, we've just spent two days talking about it with people who are super educated enough to speak, how do you explain to your average person in a way that is digestible and reasonable for them to review and accept before you know, in going in further? what they're giving up, what they're trading in order to receive the service. That's a super hard question. So I think um, the industry, as you said, Kavya, really needs to come together and start thinking about standards, where we stand. And once we, once we achieve that, a level of interoperability looks more likely. At a minimum, you know, your presentation, your avatar, maybe your entitlements. Um, we don't even have cross entitlements though in App Stores today, so who knows when that's coming? That implement that implicates you know, rev shares, payment models, and so that's difficult. But um, you know, later down the road, I don't know if we'll ever get to a place where behavior is subject to the same standards across ecosystems. Certainly, privacy and control of data will be different, especially when you're talking about nation state metaverses. But. Thanks for that. I'm going to ask. Uh, Christina, one last question, and then I'll ask each of you for an ending statement, and then we'll go to questions, if that's all right, uh, time-wise. Um, the question I wanted to focus uh, Christina on is the question of uh, inclusion, and I'd like to take it specifically to gender inclusion. I'm on the board of an organization called Women in Cybersecurity, which was formed for the sole reason of encouraging more women to enter cybersecurity. Today, there are about 23, 24% women in cybersecurity. It's a very lucrative field, but only 23. What is the problem? What, where are the structural problems? And of course, uh, I did a little quick poll here with my eyes. There's about 60, 40, 60 male, 40 female in this room on this panel, wonderful panel. I'm an ally of 
three wonderful women. So the question is, how do we deal with inclusion questions in the metaverse when the overwhelming number of digital experts, C-suite officers, financiers, entrepreneurs, and so on tend to be male? How do we improve that? So I think, first of all, we need to understand that we're not dealing with injustice. I think we have to really be honest and just say we're not dealing with it in the physical world, period, full stop. Okay, so we're not dealing with it, which means that we can't deal with it in the metaverse either, right? I mean, I can't make something work differently. It's not going to be magic. It's not going to be a silver bullet. And so Kavi and I were talking about this on the way um, into D.C. today, and I said, I actually grew up in a really weird environment. I actually grew up in communist Yugoslavia, uh, which now is Croatia, at least my home country. Um, and I moved to the US you know, in my late teenage years for college. And I told Kavi, I said, I had the weirdest childhood in a way, because I grew up in these really kind of environments where you think they were heavily male dominated. But I was also growing up in an environment where my mother would say, your cousin got a B. Of course you got an A. Of course you got an A or a girl. He's just a you know, so it's just always implied, well, of course you're doing better because you're a girl. I mean, he can't do better. He's a boy. And even to this day, I love my son, but my mom says, oh, he's just a boy. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Right. And when I moved to the U.S., I was really, really um, in a situation where I had great, great, you know, wonderful grandparents who immigrated to the U.S. And again, it was this expectation of like, you're a girl. I had two male cousins. And the question was never if I was going to go to college or not and what I was going to achieve. It was a foregone conclusion. It was more like, what are you going to study, right? And which college are you going to go to? And so when we talk about including women, I think we need to get to the point where we create the avenues that every single girl can be who she wants, be what she wants, because that's going to make certain that she grows into a woman who can be who she wants and what she wants. But I don't want to just talk about women, right? Because there's a lot of other people that should have the same right. Right? We're talking about women, and I think that that's one representation. But there's a lot of other underrepresented individuals, whether it's because your skin is too dark and you're, you're literally almost like a black color or a brown color, or you're indigenous population, or perhaps you're from the Southern Hemisphere, right? which oftentimes we forget to talk about a lot. So I think we don't have inclusion today, and it's a really flawed policy issue. I think we need to go back, and it sounds really dumb, but I think we need to start with the assumption of, yes, it's possible. I think we need to introduce a lot more education and a lot more opportunities. I'm really thrilled to actually see that, you know, from an XRSI perspective, there are now scholarships being handed out to individuals who haven't had an opportunity. Why? Because they need to be in the room right here with us, right? We need to look around and say, even in this room, how much diversity do we have? I mean, you all look like really nice people. I'd love to talk to you at break or at lunch. But we don't have a lot of diversity in this room alone. And so we can't expect the metaverse to be inclusive, to be diverse, unless we deliberately make it so. And so I think more than anything, we need to challenge ourselves and challenge everybody in the room today and everybody who's online and listening and say, look, whatever your capacity is, because we all have some level of capacity to influence, start there and start influencing and start with the assumption of like, yes, we do need inclusivity and this isn't it. Right. And I'm not sure what the right inclusivity answer is, but I know that I'm not going to come up with it on my own because I represent a very specific segment. Right. And I can provide that perspective, but I can't do it for everybody. And so, you know, I applaud you also for the work that you've been doing. And it's wonderful to hear that women are integrated. I would say go back to that board and say, you know, is it just women? Are there women of color? Can we extend that? Maybe so it's not just women. Perhaps it's somebody who's gender neutral. And that's OK, too. Right? We need to have everybody represented, but it doesn't start automatically somehow in the metaverse. There's not going to be a September 23rd or some other random date two years from now where we all wake up and it's all nirvana. It's not going to happen. You can quote me, you can write that down right now. We have to start now. It does start with policy. It starts back with education. And I just want to kind of follow on to something that Carrie said. And I think it'll tie back to the story of me growing up in this crazy environment. And it was just a foregone conclusion that you can do what you want to do and be who you want to be. Right? I could have been, you know, anything. I, I could be on a seat stress. There wouldn't have been any judgment. It wasn't like you must be a lawyer or an engineer. But I think it's about education. So I actually have a teenager now. I know I don't look it, but I do have a teenager. And one of the things that that teenager has grown up with since the time that he could speak, he did speak Croatian, by the way, at home, not English first. Um, but he's been taught digital policy 
Okay. So very early on, I said, no, your doctor's office, even though in their little form, they have a space for social security members to stop that need that information. No, you know, on the web, we do not have to give up our personal information in exchange for the services we receive. So this lovely child of mine, when he was 11, said, I want Instagram. And I said, oh, over my dead body, you better hope it's not a bus. So I found out from a friend of his that he actually created an Instagram account. I was so excited. It was the first time he came home and I was able to look at him before I busted him. He had never really been grounded. And I was just like so excited. And I'm like, yes, parental authority. And this kid came up to me and he said, yes, I created an Instagram account. I used my throwaway email address, mom. I put in the fake date. I didn't upload any photos because it has metadata associated with it. I didn't start friending anybody yet, but I'm following celebrities because that's what I'm interested in. And I looked at him and I stopped in my tracks and I realized, you know what? Can't ground the kid. He did everything right. But what it also reminded me of is it wasn't that he was 10 and we started talking about this. He's not 11 and we're talking about this. We've been talking about this since he was little which is what allowed him to come to me when he went into the public school system and say, hey, mom, there's a fundamental problem in Loudoun County school systems. What is it? Well, we work with Chromebooks. We work in Google Docs. I have a unique ID, which is my email address. It's actually my student ID number. That's what I use for my email address. That's what I use in the cafeteria to buy food. That's what Google's tracking me with. Guess what? They've basically given me a social security number and now they're tracking me everywhere. Back to your point of like, we're doing that today. What are we going to be doing in the metaverse? Again, I wouldn't have known about Loudoun public school situation unless my kid raised his hand and said so. So I want to come back to safety, privacy, inclusivity, accessibility. They all start with education. And I think that if we're passive and if we don't take a stance on our own, nobody else will. And I think that we just have ourselves to hold accountable. Can I make just of course, two follow of course you I just want to, so I'm going to keep it really quick so we have time for questions. Um, but I just want to point out, we've been talking a lot about inclusion as far as how it's once represented and your avatar, but there's also a big inclusion issue with the digital divide. And the more prevalent and the more useful and the more essential to participation in society uh, the metaverse or XR technology becomes, the more it will accentuate, of course, the divide between, you know, those of us who have ready access to the internet and those of us who don't. So I just want to, you know, kind of put that out there so that we can all, you know, not lose track of that, that kind of consideration. Uh, and then the other point I wanted to make is there is such a relationship. All of this really is, is intertwined. It's like the gnarliest Venn diagram you've ever seen, but such a relationship between safety and inclusion. When people don't feel safe, they don't participate, they don't engage. And, you know, obviously with women, but not only with women. And there's, you know, I, I can't cite the study, but, you know, people have talk, told me about them. That this is a second, third hand, so take it for what it's worth. But, you know, people walk into a new space. They don't know what the rules are. They don't know what the expectations are. They don't know who's there. So what do they do? Just like in the real world, you hang out against the wall, you kind of stand, you observe, you don't speak up. That's not active participation. That's not real representation. And, and right now that's what's happening in digital space um, or they leave. So I think that we have to remember that the relationship between inclusion and safety can't, can't be broken. And the relationship between inclusion and privacy can't be broken. And so really it's just also intertwined and there are so many trade-offs to be made. I don't think we'll ever find you know, the perfect answer. The silver bullet is not out there. But we have to try. Oh, certainly. Of course, we have to try. And um, But I personally am a fan of user agency because I don't think the right answer exists. I think the right answer is different for each individual person. Well said. And I'm being tucked to the right. A caveat, uh, you know, the floor is off. Yeah. So I actually want to make a couple of points here. When it comes to inclusion, um, and especially when, it, when we're talking about virtual wars, metaverse, and immersive environments. We need to care about both IRL in real life, in real world, the representation. Why does it matter? Because the people sitting in these big tech corporations, I call them the dude bros, they're making decisions about our lives and they have no comprehension what does a Muslim hijabi woman, perhaps from India or Iran or China, feels when they are impacted? So that's one. Next thing is these very decisions. Now, this is a dangerous territory 
especially when it comes to this intersection of AI that's going to be governing some of these virtual wars. So these very decisions are now going into the algorithms. And now those algorithms are going to determine what happens. So what we need to do, and in fact, you know, we specifically uh, have a diversity and inclusion coalition led by Noble Ackerson. Yesterday, you heard from him. He talked about social technical deficit and how we need to curb that. And you can see there is flyers I just you know put a, put away. We need to go beyond inclusion. We need to create equity. And Christina hinted at that. Talked about you know the IPOC, but like this is Pride Month. This is about transgender, queer, like LGBTQ, all these folks, any person, in fact, white people could be minorities in certain contexts. They are in India, a kind of well-respected minority, to be honest, but like they are. And so what happens when they are in danger? So these rules that we will determine will apply globally because of this intersection of AI potentially driving these things. We need to we need to create these sort of models, not just IRL, put people into these ecosystems, just like this Beyond Inclusion uh, Fellowship we created. And in fact, we are in open discussion with Microsoft. We're in discussion with, you know, Meta has funded uh, some of the initial investment and asking, oh, unity, response. We don't have budget for it. Are you kidding me? You have budget for like doing all this for humanity theater but you don't have budget for creating equity for 15 people. All that is is $150,000. And I call this out specifically because that is the case with a lot of these organizations that corporate social responsibility. So this is how we create it. Make sure that you are really true to the corporate social responsibility. You are creating equity. Where's Qualcomm? I engaged with them in November, 2020. That was my first email. 45 emails later, they still can't figure out how to work with XRSI. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So there are certain names and people that I'm like, I'm going to publicly publish this list of people who still can't figure out how to do inclusion. Whereas we have literally created a formula and put it out there that this is how you put people like me. I was a hairstylist at one point did haircutting for $10 an hour for four or five years, took immense amount of student loans. Why should I? Why shouldn't there be equity and I should be allowed to do that master's in security and put back into that ecosystem, make those decisions. I shouldn't have to fight for it. And same is with the policy too, global governments. Why is Julie Inman Grant the only person going around the world telling everybody, hey, you need safety by design, uh, for all this metaverse ecosystem, where is the rest of the world? Where where are the senators, the House of Representatives? Let's do some advocacy around it and make sure that we're not crossing this dangerous territory. This is very very dangerous. Like I am telling you, genocide will happen because we didn't go beyond inclusion and create equity. We are at that. So consider these flyers an intervention by XRSI, because that's the you know, red line we're at. Thanks very much, Kavya. I'm, in the interest of time, and take no, questions. Actually, here's what we're going to continue. Why don't we continue till like one minute to 11, because I know there's going to be time for questions. Right. Discussion. Anybody who wants coffee, anybody who wants to leave, there's coffee there, and we'll just Great. go through, we'll do the next time, Thank and you. we'll have lunch. And Great. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely can use the time. Let me suggest something. I mentioned that perhaps uh, each of the panelists should have a little time to kind of reflect and summarize, or especially around the topic of guiding policy in XR. I'm a big believer in giving the audience what they were told, what they were sold. So uh, guiding policy in XR safety and inclusion should be part of the focus. And if you permit me, I wanted to do a little variation on playing words uh, from my own perspective. And instead of saying guiding policy on XR, I wanted to give you just a minute's worth of what would it look like if the title was misspelled and said guiding policy with XR. Because I think we're, we're still in the, in the early stages of XR. But try to imagine what XR could be 
in the policy realm. And I'm going to take one, something from my own experience, which is the United Nations uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. For those of you that don't know, by 2030, we've set out 17 Sustainable Development Goals, something like 150 subcategories and something like 400 and some metrics that we're measuring. No country in the world is doing well on those sustainable development goals. And the, the outcome is climate change. The outcome is a disaster that is looming on all of us. Now, if XR could be looked on, I, I close my eyes and imagine going to Congress and putting on some glasses from every single Congress person and saying, hello, you are now in 2050. Look around you, and maybe there's devastation, there's nothing, there's water is all over the place, or water is nowhere, um, famine exists, people are killing each other, uh, people are burning each other. Um, then you say, let's take some options. Option one, do this, option two, do that. So instead of playing a game, we're actually playing with our lives. We give policymakers a vision of the future, which is based on data, which is based on analytics, which is based on model. Could that happen? Perhaps. Is it happening today? To some degree. My friend Hurry up here from the Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute works with fire departments where they're simulating real life and they're improving the ability of people to fight and to improve safety in the real world. But I just want to remind you that not only do we have to make sure that decision makers see this as, a, as a, something outside of their domain that they have to focus their scarce attention on because they got so many other things to do in industry. They got so many other things to do, the bottom line profits. But you have to make it personal, you have to make it specific. And in my mind, unless you take the big questions in society today, climate change is one, right? And I can go down the line, I can go three, four, five, and say, here's where XR fits, and here's how we can improve it and speed up the delivery. So I just wanted to give you this as, a, as an example of how XR could help policymakers, not just looking to policymakers to help XR, but XR can help policymakers. And all of a sudden, you draw them in. So with that as a as kind of a, of a quick statement, I'm going to ask each of my excellent panelists to give us maybe a five-minute summary discussion, and then we'll move to questions. If I may, so I want to, and, and, I've, and I really kept this because as I earlier said, the framework is looking at a lot of different emerging uh, regulations and approaches that people are coming on. You earlier mentioned the United Nations. So I want to cite from the Global Assessment Report, GAR 2022, released by the United Nations Office of Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR. And this is what's different about XR. One, of course, you can put the people, the regulators, make them feel like, hey, what is it like to be today in Ukraine? Or 50 years from now, potentially with the data and analytics, what does the earth look like? So the quote is, and this is about risk, because that's what we're kind of assessing, informing, preventing. Investment in understanding risk is the foundation of sustainable development. We're talking about a planet that's dying, so I continue the quote. However, the needs, this needs to link to a reworking of financial and governments, government systems to account for the real cost of current inaction to address risks like climate change. Without this, financial balance sheets, governance, decision-making will remain fragmented and will be rendered to increasingly inaccurate and ineffective. Risk assessment until today has only happened. Oh, we're going to lose this number, the dollar. We're going to lose our planet. That should be our biggest priority when we assess risk. Thereafter is the human in the loop. Thereafter is the society in the loop. But the planet must be. Earlier, Alvin said, oh, we're doing sustainable development things and all that. But I asked. We are rapidly updating these devices, device after device is put out there. Where does that device go to live <coughs> in the landfills, right? The, the earlier devices, where do they go? We don't have right to repair. The only organization gives right to repair just for a little tools and screws 
is HTC. We, XRSI, asked for right to repair from Meta, like in early 2020s, for all these XR devices. We don't own these devices. We don't own operating systems. Why not? Even the cybersecurity researcher myself, if I hack that device today, because I don't have a right to repair, I could be potentially subjected to any kind of a uh, you know, prosecution, perhaps, or at least some penalty. So right to repair type of stuff. You know, and this very risk assessment needs to happen from hey, climate change, so SDGs. That's that's the priority, and that's what we'll that's, that's great. Actually, I just wanted to go off this and do a report for site. So oh, the communications there. <laughs> there you go. It's all for circle. It's, all, the, right it's all a magic circle. Yep. Um, uh, we next go to Kerry for a summary uh, remarks. Okay. Um, well, I'm just going to be really honest. I don't have a lot to say about climate change, actually. I don't. I don't work in that field, and I don't. But I do. I do have something to say about corporations and regulation of XR. Um, I think it is a mistake for corporations to take the position that they can't afford to think about safety, security, inclusion in XR. Um, I think, and and I and I hope that. The kind of general assumption that that is the that is the point of view corporations have will slowly change because corporations will change. I believe, for many reasons, climate change, uh, you know, it opening up communications channels between people, uh, a better world for all of us. I think that if we don't have inclusion, if we don't have prolific use of XR technologies, not only will things get worse and worse and worse, but the technology will die, and so will the Needs to build it. So, you know, one thing I tell my clients all the time is this isn't compliance, it's a feature. Like, you need this. Inclusion means customers. If you are only serving a, you know, rapidly shrinking segment of the population, you're not going to sell your devices. So, obviously, there is a moral and ethical imperative, of course, but there is also a financial imperative. It, it is necessary to create a device that appeals to a broad range of people that can be used safely and with a feeling of trust by lots and lots and lots of customers. And in fact, the whole vision of the metaverse is to connect humans. If you're only connecting one type of human, what have you created? Nothing. It's useless. And so that's what I think you know, corporations need to focus on. And when we're talking about regulation or governance, there are three tiers of governance, right? There's um, black letter law, regula regulations, but there's also corporate governance and there's user governance. And I think that we need to focus in this space, especially we talked about how this is gonna move more towards users. I think we need to focus on corporations really thinking seriously about what they're creating and the tools that they're putting out there and how these new technological innovations need to consider from the start, safety by design, privacy by design, how they need to consider maintaining faith to the principles of regulation, consent, safety, security in their tool set. And I then think, you know, the next layer down, much of that will be achieved by empowering the user, by creating a safe online culture, by creating cultural norms within the metaverse, and by giving users the tools they need to empower their interaction and make themselves feel safe in the space that they're in. Great. That's a great comment. Thank, thanks, Gary. Uh, Christina, you're the last one to summarize. So I've been looking at these two pillars in front of me for quite some time now. And I think of the one on my left-hand side is where we are and the right one where we're going. The one on the left says education is transformational and the one on the right says knowledge is power. And I can't think of anything more appropriate than to summarize where we are and where we're going. I think we've been talking about policy. I work squarely in digital policy, which isn't just about the folks on the Hill. It's about the corporations, it's about the citizens, it's about academia, it's about each and every one of us. And so what I would like to do is say to you one, several things actually. One is all of us as human beings aren't going to ever change unless we're uncomfortable. That's just a fact, right? I don't actually exercise because I love running every day. I exercise because I'm getting older and my doctor told me I'm gonna get fatter and actually my heart's gonna get weaker. So I really just need to exercise more, right? I wasn't thinking that when I was 20, that's my reality. So I've been made uncomfortable. So I'm gonna change my behavior. We are starting to see corporations change their behavior. The reality though is unless they're going to end up on the 
front page of the New York Times, or unless they're going to have their bottom line hit, they're not going to change. Now, they are starting to change incrementally because consumers are demanding that, which is why we see environmental, social, and governance considerations, which is the equivalent of the SDGs for individual corporations. And that's actually being written into um, strategic plans. It's being demanded by board of directors, so there is hope. But I think we have to understand that it's an ecosystem, right? We can't just tell to uh, say to corporations, change, because I want you to change. We actually have to make them want to change. As consumers, we can demand that. And I think that we have a lot of corporations out there that are willing to change, right? Unfortunately, they aren't heroes. They're not talked about on CNN. Because why? Doing the right thing doesn't get you brownie points necessarily, unless you're talking directly to a consumer. It's really the bad guys that end up on Capitol Hill having to testify, and they're in the news day and then. So I would come back to this notion and ask each of us to really think about education as being a transformational point to start with, right? As I'm looking around the room, I'm wondering why we don't have more folks from the Hill just coming down here to join us and talk about XR. I think it's great that all of you have made time to be here to think about these concepts, share your experience, but I would argue that this room is too small. We should have had even more people here talking about this because it is imminent not just from a climate perspective, but just from a human existence perspective, where we're heading and how we're going to use technology, whether it's going to be for good or for bad. So we have the corporations, we're starting to slowly change them. We have to demand more, we have to expect more, we have to put that onus out there. We need to do the same thing with our rulemakers and our lawmakers. We live in a country where it only regulates once we actually can identify harms. Okay, there is no expectation on my mind that we are proactively going to have a government that just goes out there and protects us because it's the right thing to do. It's not the way that we work in the United States. And it's not necessarily bad, right? Again, we need to govern at the right point. Otherwise, if we govern too early, we're going to quash innovation and creativity. We don't want to do that. We do want to actually have some good come out of whatever technology is coming at us. So don't govern too early, but start thinking about what is the right way to govern and at what point do we govern which again comes back to this education, the need to actually not just take goggles up to the hill and show them, but continually just ask them, what is the harm? I tell people, right? I mean, Senator Warner, when he actually attended the, um, uh, the uh, XRSI um, Human Rights Day in uh, December 10th last year, said it really well. He said, you know what? I'm probably one of the youngest people on the hill and I don't even know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? So great. Then there's no shame in that. I also don't know a lot of things about merchant marines, but I can be taught. I'm smart. Education is transformational. I fundamentally believe that. And knowledge is power. So we need to start educating ourselves. We need to actually call on academia. We need to call on everybody else to be inclusive, to demand safety, right? To do equity as I build equity into the process, but ensure that we're actually building the right way. And so if we're not doing it individually, we're not sharing that education with others, it can start out with, you know, I started with my child when he was younger, start out with your neighbor, your mom. I mean, you're all here talking about XR. So you know enough to educate others around you, right? It doesn't have to be a grand scale. It can happen with each one of us. And I would say, why not have today be the day that we start to do that? Because that's what's going to really make us safe. And it will move policy. It will move environments. And we will have a safe metaverse for everybody. Great. This is a great way to end the presentation part. And Susan, I'm looking to you to help us listen. First of all, we could open it to the, to the audience here, the physical audience or the online audience. So, uh, What's your let's preference? Let's do one from the online, which relates uh, to Callie's point. And um, this person asked, and then we'll go right to the audience. Um, Facebook very intentionally intruded itself into our culture. Um, through the premium model, parents have no choice. Um, do, do the panelists see public officials, such as school administrators, being more mindful of adoption of this new technology, which is often offered free? You know, it's interesting. I actually insisted that my school board member meet with me a few weeks ago. And I literally just walked in and I said, I'm not one of these crazy moms who's going to shame you on Facebook if I don't get the answer I want. Let's just have an open dialogue. And I said, so we're using Chromebooks, great. Right? You know, we're using Google Docs, Google, you know, Google's environment, wonderful. What is the retention policy on all of this data you're collecting about my kid? And like the look was incredible because not only is this individual a school board member, he's actually a cybersecurity expert, somebody who really understands what I'm talking about when I ask the question. So I think that schools don't understand. I think that we're in a situation where we're not funding schools enough. 
So we're having to rely on free services. And guess what? Nothing is free, as we all know. So what are we sacrificing in exchange? Usually it's our children's data, which may be used today. It may not. I don't know. I do know that uh, from a records retention perspective, what I've been told, at least in my school district, is all of the information that my child interacts with is kept until at least he graduates, if not longer. There is no retention uh, policy on record. And so I think that, again, going back, I know this is horrible. I keep kind of getting on my soapbox and saying education. We have to educate. We actually have to explain to parents what it means to have free things. We have to understand what is it that we're paying with. And what are the consequences? And so whether it's Facebook or if it's Google or if it's somebody else, I think we still need to come back to this notion of what is it that we're trading? What are we giving up? And in what context are we accessing services? I think just saying continuously, well, the privacy policy was too long to read is a foregone conclusion and that's really old world thinking. Yes, we can't necessarily just put all the onus and we should not put the onus on consumers, including parents and children, but by the same token, we do have to educate and we do actually have to do that in an ecosystem. Again, it can't be passive. Um, can I, yes, please. Yeah, I just want to add to the very question that we were asking, are we going to be more mindful? And I just want to point out a certain fact here, um, especially from policymakers' perspective. It's not that not people are not looking at it. So, we advised on a certain law, which is uh, Children Advancement Media and Research Act, Camera Act, look it up. It has virtual reality, augmented reality mentioned. We coordinated with Senator Ed Markey, and it was introduced, sponsored by Representative Rask Jamie Raskin. And um, so the point is, this law was introduced, and it literally tells, like, hey, neuromarketing, neurocognitive aspects must be researched. It was introduced to the House on March 23rd, 2021. This actually came, like we started advising like 2020, 2029, 2020. Nothing. So are we going to be more mindful? There are people on the Hill, as well as in different organizations, the policy team of Meta that we work with, uh, and like Microsoft, I've opened dialogue with Grace Wong. Uh, there are several organizations and policymakers that are moving the needle in the right direction. But again, like, you know, introduced to the house, what is that good do? That is asking for $25 million, which should have been spent in 2020, so that we should have had some answers about how children's minds are going to be impacted by neuromarketing, by these cognitive influential technologies. We don't have those answers. All we have is a 13 plus checkbox, still, till date. We don't have adoption for ICO UK's age appropriate design yet. All we have is the bill. So that's the thing, you know, we need to do more research. And that's why, like, there are people who want them, want these things to be adopted more mindfully. They exist in these big tech organizations. They exist at the Hill. They exist globally, Julian Mann Grant I'm talking about. But we need to get behind these people when they talk and hopefully join stuff like XRSI, all these other organizations, go beyond inclusion, all this stuff. And also, Kavya, sorry, this is just to kind of make one additional point, which is ask the question also, why is Julie the only safety commissioner in the world, right? Why, why is it? Is she really unique? I mean, she's a very special lady, don't get me wrong, but she's not that unique. We should have that kind of role in every government, around every policy, right? Somebody who's actively thinking and, and talking and working towards safety and privacy. And we don't have that. The question is, why not? And I think, again, go back and ask for that. So it sounds like we need coordination, not only in the tech world, we need coordination in the public administration, public political science. We need to engage with people who understand the ways and wherefores of government. Um, and, uh, at the same time, industry, you mentioned, you made a plea for having a table where industry leaders can sit and, and talk about these things. Well, these platforms are difficult to maintain, they're expensive to maintain, and the rationale for them isn't necessarily uh, uh, easy to absorb by an individual. It's easy to absorb the concept, but then when it comes time for you to put up, put up some money to have that platform, you say, well, I'll let somebody else do it. Um, so let's let's start the questions. Uh, I have the young man in the back, I'll bid you. So yes, please, I'll go to you next. Thank you very much. So I want to emphasize a little bit on the initial remarks when you like highlighted that social XR has like this, what 
what I would consider a privacy safety trade-off for like the platform led, led safety or like what is called behavior moderation has significant privacy concerns. And we, we address that like, user agencies have potential response, like mainly to the decentralized behavior moderation to, to individual tools. But I feel like current regulatory sentiment is pushing platforms against it by pushing them to have a more proactive and interventionist approach due to, for example, the, the intent to increase liability for, for third party content. So in, my question would be like, what is that feasibility of that user centric regime because of that? And especially as like a specialized, a decentralized system might have more inconsistent enforcement which might lead to undesirable behavior to slip to the cracks. How do you think that's feasible? Not only public sentiment, but like for regulators in the US and abroad. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, I think that might be the only feasible solution. I think that if you have a decentralized system, there's no government, there's nobody to do moderation and take down, right? That in the most extreme scenario, the only thing you have is users controlling their own interaction, their own experience, you know, blocking unknown users, the safety bubble, an escape button, whatever it might be. Um, I, I don't think that anything ever needs to get that extreme. But you know, if we're moving towards a world of interoperability, a world of decentralization, or even a world where we're talking about harms that can't be necessarily foreseen, or if they are going to be foreseen, that comes at you know, a sizable kind of cost to privacy. So maybe we decide that's not a trade-off we want to make. I think that user agency and user controls is, you know, a solution, maybe not the perfect solution, but is a solution that we should all be thinking about more seriously. And I think the industry should be investing in, especially because the old model of takedown, which is all reactive, isn't really appropriate when you're talking about trying to prevent harms you know, to the framework rather than just stop them from persisting. All right, let's hear from several people. I promise the microphone to you next. And if you can address it to a particular speaker, your question. Be more broad. <clears throat> But it's a question. Yes. Okay. Go ahead then. So, what do you think about making companies liable if there is a mistake, a problem? Because you need to have an incentive. And I, I say that coming from the perspective that in mid 1990s, in Brazil, was decided the banks will be liable for any breach in the bank accounts. So early 2000s, every single bank has dual factor authentication. So they, which until today is not common practice in the banking industry in the United States. But the banks had a very good incentive because they are liable and they need to prove that the customer made a mistake in, in handling the data. And so for them to become like, let's fix, let's fix this. So why do you think about in some situations that if you're doing nothing, because as a, a CEO, I want to maximize profit. Shame, yeah, with them, not with me. My company never gonna have a problem. So what do you think the idea to flip the liability? About, yeah, so the liability piece. We tried that with GDPR. In fact, uh, in 2018, uh, I was meeting with global computer emergency response teams in uh, Romania, and we were exploring the very questions like, how do we get these people to act? Like, we we're talking about big tech organizations to like go one way or the other and get it, you know, some influence. In the only real answer is that sort of take their money away, take their lunch money away. But here's what started to happen. Facebook paid $5 billion to FTC around that Cambridge Analytica scandal. Companies have started to factor that money into their risk assessment. So the liability, as soon as you say, this much money I will take from you if you violate this, they're going to factor that in calculate, do their balance sheet, 
And that is the evasion around it. And so what I feel is to better incentivize is not to just about faults. How about we put some responsibility, not just liability, but responsibility, accountability back. So I feel like how about asking these companies to spend X, could be any number, percentage of dollar of their marketing budget on education and awareness, X percentage of dollar on equity, X percentage of people, representatives from different minority groups. Like that's better of an incentive. They can't get away from it. You just have to do it. You know, and you, it does, it's not conditional that, you know, oh, and you made a mistake, so now pay. No, you just have to factor that in into your business plan. And that way, is, I feel that everybody benefits, the researchers benefit, the minority groups benefit. <clears throat> so I think there is a point in that, but the incentivization has to be really thought through from a prevention of harm, proactive mitigation perspective, because in this metaverse, I always say, like, you can't unsee things. You can't undo harm, which is happening in the real life on your cognitive neural functions, and then in virtual environment, both places you need to mitigate. Right. I'm actually going to, I normally agree a lot with Kavi. I'm going to disagree slightly. Actually, I think that your point is very valid, but I actually agree with you, Ari, which is I do think, like I said earlier, organizations just like, you know, I don't want to exercise, organizations don't want to change. And the only times they want to change is if there's a threat to the bottom line, which is profit, right? Or reputation. That's usually the case when there's an exist. There is nothing that gets an executive moving faster than telling them that their face is going to be on CNN. Like I've actually seen this in real life. Like it is fascinating how fast they can move when they want to. And so I've actually seen this firsthand. I work with multinationals day in and day out. We actually have seen GDPR take an impact. I think the problem in the fault with GDPR and other regulations around <laughs> privacy is the actual enforcement, right? It's actually cat and mouse in some instances, like the matter of Facebook. But go and look at Verb. Look at uh, Verb uh, Mobile. If you've ever heard of this company, maybe not. They were based in Bethesda. They decided to actually abandon the EU market when GDPR came into effect. And yet they were a ad platform um, company that was doing really well. And financially, they were doing phenomenally in the EU. And they actually made a calculation that they say, hey, you know what? We can't comply with GDPR. We're going to abandon the market. And so it mm -hmm. does work. It doesn't work at scale. I can guarantee you no solution is going to work 100% of the time. But I have seen quite well. Right, the accountability and the fiscal impact work, especially in this culture. It doesn't work in every country and every culture, but for a lot of the Western countries, it's a perfect solution in a way. You just have to make sure that the dollar amount that has to be written out or the euro amount that has to be written out on the check is high enough. And you've seen this firsthand, right? The bank snapped to grid. Why? Because otherwise they were going to be impacted and voila, to factor authentication across the board. One last shot for Gary, and then we have to go. So I'm gonna keep it really brief, but as the the, the, the big corporation person here, um, it, it totally works, like for sure. Um, there are already a lot of regulations that are imposed on, you know, that are, will apply to the metaverse. GDPR is one of them. There's certain types of online conversation that you know we need to shut down. Obviously, there all there's all kinds of things. Um, and so yes, that that is. But, but I, I view that as the least desirable option, not from the big company's point of view, but from society's point of view. And I go back to the um, safety and security and inclusion as a feature. I think your point about education and Kavya made the point kind of in the same way, you know, investing in broad user-based studies, in working with people in you know, rural areas, that's all education, right? The company starts to learn. They start to learn about what their customers really want, who's really out there, what the product needs to truly reach its fullest potential. Um, I wish that we didn't have to require companies to engage in that kind of behavior. I wish that that was something that the market demanded and that actually sold products. And, you know, maybe for some people it does. But um, I think that if we had more education, if people really understood what they were giving up, what the trade-offs were, and what the real potential of this technology is, if done right, then there would be a sufficient mm -hmm. demand that it would make total sense to invest your, you know, finite engineering dollars in building a safety model or in building, you know, a really inclusive avatar generation tool or whatever it might be. So, so that is my hope. 
Um, and I think that it's education of the population, but also education of the company and the engineers, because they, they don't know, you know, this space like you guys do. Let's, let's uh, give our tremendous panel a round of applause.